Lee. I'm from Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Um, I'm also the uh, co-lead of Physical Oceanography Community of Practice. Today, we are very pleased to announce that uh, we have two experts on marine carbon removal is going to discuss um, the, um, the challenges and opportunities for, um, for marine carbon removal in the US Arctic waters. Um, for those of you who don't know what is IRPIC, IRPIC is the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee. It brings together leaders from 18 agencies, departments, and offices across the US federal government to enhance collaboration on research in the Arctic. Um, IRPIC collaboration is a public branch of IRPIC. It aims to facilitate interagency communication, collaboration, and cooperation to advance uh, Arctic science. Physical oceanography a community of practice aims to coordinate research of the physical oceanography of the Arctic Ocean. Today, um, the meeting's goal is to um, uh, because uh, effectively removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and ocean where minimized environmental impact is a significant challenge. It really requires uh, investment and partnership for government agencies and the private sectors. Even though there are many ways to remove carbon dioxide, it is very difficult to quantify the amount of carbon dioxide removed. Uh, our session will focus on ocean carbon sequestration, especially on Alaska, is a U.S. federal budget for FY24 marine carbon and dioxide removal has been increased over 60%. So we are very glad that we have two experts, Dr. Jessica from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and Dr. Matthew Long, who is a co-founder and executive director from SeaWorth, going to talk about the carbon related, um, carbon, uh, marine carbon removal related topic. Each speaker will have 15 minutes of, of time to present. Then we will have 15 minutes of discussion followed by five minutes of a team member update. Um, yeah, welcome Dr. Jessica Cross, the floor is yours. Um, hi everybody. How is my screen share doing? Right now we're seeing presenter mode. Thank you. How about now? Yep. Perfect. Looks great. Yeah. Let me just briefly grab that again. Now I can still see everybody. All right. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. And thanks so much for having me at IARPIC. Um, for those of you who haven't met me before, my name's Jessica Cross, as you heard in the introduction. I'm currently at Pacific Northwest National Labs based in Seattle, Washington, on the traditional homelands of the Duwamish, uh, but I uh, have recently, just recently joined the lab. I spent the last decade working for NOAA, uh, where I had the opportunity to kind of pivot uh, to uh, some of the content that you're hearing today. So this is very much, you know, a cross-agency, like, field-level perspective uh, in this talk today. So uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with carbon removal, I thought I'd give you a crash course here just in the first couple of minutes, because I know you're also interested in the regional perspective, and I want to make sure that we're able to get to that. Um, uh, uh, while it was uh, a, a focus of the international climate community to really try and emphasize emissions reductions for the first several decades of considering climate action, the IPCC has acknowledged that we've been too slow on reducing our emissions reductions. And if we're going to achieve our climate goals at this point, we are going to have to rely on both steep emissions reductions as well as removing carbon from the atmosphere. Um, if you're curious to learn more about what the IPCC says about carbon removal, they've prepared a fact sheet in addition to an entire chapter of the most recent AR6 report. Uh, you can scan the QR code there and I'll be happy to share these slides. Uh, you can also click this hyperlink. Um, to find out more uh, about the IPCC's perspective here. Um, the truth is that there are many different ways to remove carbon from the atmosphere. And often I'm asked, which one is best? Or are we going to be able to solve all our problems with DAC? 
or how do we even know that this is going to work? Uh, and that really depends on the method that you're talking about. There are a lot of different ways to measure and balance these methods against each other. Um, and there are a handful of different ways you can evaluate them shown on the right hand side of this slide here. So you can think, you know, essentially about five key questions. How much carbon are you removing? How fast are you removing it? How long are you storing it? How safe is this entire process? And how sure are you about the other questions that are in this list? Um, economists might ask things as well about how leaky your method is. And leakage can be everything from actually escaping gas from a well, um, uh, or you might be thinking about offsetting other industries. So this kind of has a complex definition. Uh, and economists might also ask what the cost of it is. Is any of this cost effective, right? Um, uh, uh, this graphic um, uh, was shown in the IPCC report, and you can see uh, issues of time scale sort of listed in these colors here. You can think about the removal process that you're relying on, whether you're relying on photosynthesis, electrochemistry, or rocks uh, to be able to store your carbon. Maybe you're more focused on land, which you can see in the green shading in the back here, or maybe you're more focused on the ocean uh, shown in the blue background here. I definitely do not have time to talk to you about all of these different methods. Uh, if you're curious about reading more. Again, I encourage you to uh, check out Cross Chapter Box 8 um, or uh, the, I believe it's Chapter 5 uh, in the AR6 report that talks specifically about carbon removal. Part of the reason that I'm here talking to you today uh, and, be, and that you're hearing so much about carbon removal in the news is that offset markets are growing um, and they're already very, very big. Um, JP Morgan bought 800,000 tons of advanced market commitment on May 23rd of this year. Uh, this graphic is from CDR.FYI showing uh, the total cumulative purchases of carbon um, uh, offsets and removals. Um, but it's also important to note that even though people are buying these, they are advanced market commitments. It's a way of paying in advance for a product that doesn't exist yet. Uh, and delivery is actually quite small. So even though you see a lot of these offsets being purchased, only about 2.4% of them actually exist uh, and have been delivered. Part of the reason that's true is that it's very, very difficult right now uh, to reliably measure the actual removal part. Um, uh, figuring out how to apply discounts and account for uncertainty and risks is very, very challenging. Um, so this is a, a graph from Bloomberg Green showing uh, that even of delivered offsets, less than 5% actually remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, and that's you know uh, the most true for renewable energy. Energy. That's the most reliable way uh, to deliver offsets. When it comes to carbon removal technologies at the time of this publication, it was 0% actually remove carbon from the atmosphere, in part because that delivery is so low. We're starting to change that now. Um, uh, the Verge reported uh, just at the early part of this year that Climeworks, a direct air capture facility, had third-party auditor verification of the amount that, uh, of carbon that's been removed. And I'm working with this slide to actually tee up the next presentation you're going to hear, uh, which is from Matt Long at Seaworthy, who's trying to help solve some of these very clear challenges of measurement, monitoring, verification uh, of removals. So in addition to thinking about can we actually measure this, it's important to remember that there are some methods of CDR that may have high energy or water or land use or environmental costs associated with them, but it's really hard for us to estimate that at this current juncture too. So even though we might know what questions to ask about carbon removal, figuring, about, figuring out how we answer those questions about carbon removal is another story altogether. Um, uh, this table is from NOAA's uh, uh, research strategy for carbon removal, which again, you can find uh, either at this QR code. I realize it's small. You may not be able to take a very good picture of it, um, but the source uh, is here as well um, in a hyperlink when this presentation is circulated later. So as we think about trying to, you know, reduce the amount of risk, we uh, really think about trying to 
trying to deploy a portfolio of carbon removal actions. The more diverse carbon removal we have, the less of an individual cost each method can exert on a particular place. Um, this is a great paper um, uh, that kind of lives rent-free in my brain that essentially showcases uh, that, that fact. This is particularly true for the global south. Um, the more diverse methods they have, the, the more options they have to reduce environmental impacts uh, or uh, costs that are associated with competing with other sustainable development goals uh, in those regions. Um, and that's also, while this paper focuses a, uh, on this from a national context, that's also going to be true in a regional context. So even as we start talking about places like the Arctic, the more options that we have, the less likely we have to deploy bad options in certain places, and the more options we're able to give local communities uh, in order to exercise their rights, right? Maybe they want one form of carbon removal, but not another one based on a variety of different factors. And again, the more methods we have, the better off everybody's going to be. So what's going on in the Arctic and what's going on in Alaska right now? Um, I'm going to briefly walk everybody through this uh, and try and think about the different methods that are being discussed. Um, uh, I have a bias towards Alaska because that's where I've worked for most of my career. Um, uh, but I also want to emphasize that there are a variety of other working groups and folks on this call that may have a broad understanding of what um, other options are happening in the Arctic right now as well. So diving right in, uh, many of you may have heard that Alaska recently passed a bill uh, that authorizes state lands for carbon management purposes. The word hydrosphere is also used in this legislation, so that means that state waters uh, can also be used uh, for carbon removal. So primarily, the bill itself is focused on soil carbon, um, this idea that of uh, 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 of being able to use forests to draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, effectively, Governor Dunleavy doesn't want to cut down the Tongass, but earn carbon credits for it. Uh, the other thing uh, that it's really focused on is this idea of mineralization. Um, with the oil and gas industry already uh, heavily invested in Alaska, you can envision uh, that there may be opportunities for direct air capture hubs, as well as geologic storage of any carbon that is captured as part of a direct air capture hub. Um, these images, again, are from NOAA's uh, Carbon Dioxide Re uh, Removal Research Strategy, uh, which you can find at the images source. And then if you're curious to learn more about the legislation, you can find that at the hyperlink here. Governor Dunleavy is also very interested and invested in mariculture and particularly in kelp farming. Um, if you are curious uh, about his comments here, you can find them at the link again. Um, and the truth is that macroalgal farming is a, a really big interest for Alaskan communities. Um, many of you will be aware of that and working on that in other particular pathways. It's really hard right now to use kelp to remove carbon from the atmosphere. There's just the cost effectiveness of it is not as good as using it for foodstuffs um, or bioplastics or other end sources for that material. Um, uh, uh, that being said, uh, for those companies that and small businesses that might be interested in using kelp for carbon removal, the recent legislation does include macroalgal farming as a as a way of um, uh, uh, supporting carbon credits. Uh, uh, that was recently passed. That recent bill that was passed in Alaska. Um, another thing that I'm really interested in, and there's been a couple of projects on, uh, is uh, that Alaska is a really great place to study natural analogs for carbon removal in some respect. Kelp does grow naturally there. And we have the opportunities to at least study how efficient that carbon removal might be or how we might be able to use multi-trophic farming methods in order to support some of that going forward. Um, the amount of glacial silt uh, and carbonate runoff that happens from Alaskan coasts and waters also makes this a great area to study natural analogs for another method of carbon removal called alkalinity enhancement. Um, Alex Gagnon at the University of Washington uh, has a project in Prince William Stown studying that and I uh, I took some measurements there last year in Glacier Bay, uh, focusing on the exact same thing. What can we learn about the natural discharge of alkalinity that might tell us about what um, engineered alkalinity enhancement might look like? 
If you're curious to learn more about alkalinity enhancement, there are a variety of different methods. Um, the uh, uh, natural analogs that we're studying here really focus on mineral alkalinity enhancement, where we're actually adding mineral carbonates to the water, but we can also generate alkalinity through electrochemical approaches, like I mentioned earlier. This is effectively taking weak acid out of seawater, storing it as carbon dioxide or hydrogen um, or HCl, right? Um, storing that carbon dioxide and then uh, returning a CO2 pore or naturally a higher alkalinity stream back into seawater. I also have been a part of some modeling studies that are currently uh, taking off in Alaska. Um, and while uh, these are getting a lot of attention, I want to emphasize that uh, even though you see maps like this, there are no experiments underway yet. These are just biogeochemical modeling studies showcasing what, you know, if we had an alkalinity enhancement experiment, let's say in Dutch Harbor, which is a great place for spreading material out over very wide areas, wide areas, more contact with the atmosphere, you get better drawdown uh, of carbon. Um, uh, uh, that being said, these are just biogeochemical modeling studies. Um, as you can see from this graph here, uh, it, there's also a measurement challenge uh, in that there's a variety of different concentrations we're going to need to measure. Uh, and I'm sure that Matt will talk about uh, the key challenges associated with that too. Another interest uh, for Alaskan carbon removal uh, for the Alaskan carbon removal community has been whether or not carbon removal can reverse ocean acidification. And probably not, um, unless there's steep parallel emissions reductions. Um, these things have to happen in tandem for us to have a meaningful impact on the atmosphere. Um, there's been some recent research that set, that suggests that large-scale alkalinity enhancement like the kind that's being modeled here could maybe pause um, additional acidification, but it's going to be very hard to run that process in reverse and also remove carbon from the atmosphere at the same time. Some of these carbon removal techniques could help us remove uh, anthropogenic CO2 from the ocean, but we have to try and do that away from the atmosphere because if you remove carbon and then just draw more in from the atmosphere, all you've done is have a net neutral effect, right? Uh, so maybe we can do this at the bottom of the ocean, inject alkalinity onto coral reefs to help mitigate the impact of ocean acidification on coral reefs. But since you're not in contact with the atmosphere, you're not actually pulling any carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and it's kind of an either or situation. There are some uh, folks that are starting to think right now about whether or not it's possible for a for one carbon removal installation to do both of these things at the same time. You'll have a lower efficiency of carbon removed from the atmosphere, but you could conceivably inject alkalinity at both the surface and at the bottom and try and solve both of these problems at the same time. There's been a number of uh, workshops as well in Alaska really focused on understanding, you know, what community uh, or what the community is interested in researching, what they're concerned about, what the opportunities are for carbon removal across the state, what the risks are for carbon removal across the state. Um, those have been sponsored by AUS. Uh, you can find um, the uh, discussion series uh, notes and recordings at this link here on this slide. Um, and really the takeaway messages for us have been uh, that public trust is really key to any kind of climate action. Um, we're not going to be able to do this without the support of uh, local communities. Um, it's important to communicate the urgency of action, but in Alaska, climate change is a lived experience. People want to build resilience. People want uh, to take action on climate change. The challenge is doing that while responsibly characterizing the risks and building a sense of shared values. And one way we think we might be able to move forward with that is by uh, creating codes of conduct for research projects. Lots of people are eager to get involved. There's all kinds of um, uh, ways to do that. I encourage you to reach out to the Alaska Ocean Acidification Network and to AUS if you are interested in participating in those spaces. How am I doing on time? That's great. That's like 50 minutes. Even. Right on dot. It's even. Yeah. Great. All right, Matt, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Je Jessica Cross, for the excellent presentation. Now we are going to welcome uh, our next speaker, Dr. Mercy Long. 
Okay, great. I think you can see my slides. Yes, and yeah. hear me okay? Right. Okay. Um, thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, I have to give a proviso. I'm not going to talk much about the Arctic. I apologize. Um, I hope that doesn't come off as a bait and switch, but I'd like to talk about um, this initiative that I've been working on um, uh, called Seaworthy. Um, and let me just give you a synopsis of what uh, I'm going to tell you today. Uh, a lot of this dovetails very nicely with what Jessica um, said, but I'm going to present a slightly different approach or a perspective on some of the introductory materials. So hopefully that's complementary. And then talk a little bit uh, more in a more directed sense on explicitly the problems related to MRV. So as Jessica teed up nicely, um, we cannot meet the climate targets uh, uh, enshrined in the Paris Agreement without carbon dioxide removal. Um, ocean CDR has the potential to scale to yield climate relevant uh, removal, um, but a functioning market requires effective MRV. And currently there are no accepted methodologies or standards for MRV. And we know a priori that MRV is challenging given the dynamic nature of the ocean system. Um, this is the key challenge that we are seeking to confront at Seaworthy. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through the argument here. So first of all, the thing that you need to know to understand the requirement for carbon removal is encapsulated in this graph. This is the transient climate response to emissions, to cumulative emissions. And basically what we, what we see is that uh, the climate is, uh, that, that global uh, mean temperature is linearly dependent on the cumulative emissions. Right? And so if we want to meet a climate target, the implication is that we have to abide by a finite uh, CO2 emissions budget. The way this works is when we emit CO2, there's uh, an accumulation of that CO2 in the atmosphere and that leads to climate change. Notably, this manifests from two different sensitivities. First, the carbon sensitivity, only about half of our emissions remain in the atmosphere at present. Um, and then the climate sensitivity, which is to say the change in temperature for a given change in atmospheric CO2. Um, but it's actually more complicated than that because as the climate change changes, that has an impact on the airborne fraction of emissions through uh, changes in the efficacy of the natural sinks for CO2. All this stuff together manifests in this one line and actually is kind of amazing that it appears to be a relatively uh, linear relationship. Um, whether or not that's actually the case or whether it's an artifact of the Earth system models that have been used to derive this quantity is a really interesting and active area of research. But the implication is that we have a finite budget in order to maintain compliance with the uh, climate targets. And that at current emissions rates uh, leads to a finite time horizons for us being able to emit CO2. Um, the nature of the cuts in emissions that are required if we're just going to cut emissions to maintain to maintain these budgets are quite draconian and um, really unfeasible. So that yields this idea that uh, we need to basically follow something like a net zero trajectory, which is to say that we'll continue to emit CO2 and abate emissions as fast as we can, but there will be a requirement for active removal, negative emissions, so as to um, maintain the, the budget. And it's worth pointing out that that's true even in the case of an overshoot scenario where we pass the targets, we will wanna be uh, removing CO2 to bring climate back into line. Um, the amount of carbon dioxide removal required is pretty astounding. By 2050, we expect uh, the requirement of essentially doubling the global ocean, uh, the current global ocean sink for anthropogenic CO2. So that's a very, very large number. And again, doubling again by 2100. So that brings us to the ocean. The ocean comprises 72% of the planet's surface area, and it already absorbs about a quarter of atmospheric or of anthropogenic CO2 emissions. Um, uh, and it is also the largest um, CO2 reservoir, um, on active CO2 reservoir on the planet. So there've been a variety of technologies um, proposed for uh, activating carbon dioxide removal. Some include nutrient fertilization, like ocean iron fertilization, uh, macroalgae cultivation, and subsequent sinking. And then techniques that uh, entail changing the ocean buffer capacity, like ocean alkalinity enhancement. Jessica mentioned a lot of these. 
Um, notably, there's a lot of private sector investment into this space. Um, Frontier is a, a more than $1 billion fund for, uh, for pre-purchase market commitment. So Frontier has already started to buy carbon removal with the objective of incentivizing R&D in that space. And there's a ton of startup companies seeking to deploy uh, ocean CDR technologies in the ocean. Some of them are actually doing field trials or um, proposing to do field trials. And, and some of them are actually selling carbon credits in bespoke transactions with uh, corporations. It's worth noting that there's an ecosystem of actors in this space. Isometric, for example, is a company that is situated as an MRV or new carbon removal registry. But a key uh, deficiency is that nobody really knows how to effectively quantify um, the net removal associated with ocean CDR deployments. To give you a sense of the challenges, I'm going to show this animation here. So this is from an ocean alkalinity enhancement experiment that is conducted in the community earth system model. We released alkalinity at that injection site off West Africa. And what the animation in the top panel shows is the ensuing um, uh, anomaly in the surface ocean PCO2 field. Um, notably, you can see right off the bat that this, the, the, the anomaly induced by this uh, finite area injection is enormous in its spatial scale. Essentially, in the entire North Atlantic is, uh, is activated by this uh, effect, but the magnitude of the signal is extremely small. In the bottom left, plot, you see the temporal evolution of the CDR, the actual uptake, uh, normalized by the amount of alkalinity we put in. And so there's an initial uh, fast response, and then a very slow response as some fraction of this material has been mixed to depth and, uh, and slowly gets slowly reemerges to the surface where it can have an impact on gas exchange. Notably, the efficiency here culminates after 15 years of model integration at a number about 0.65 that is substantially lower than what we might expect from the thermodynamic efficiency uh, predicted just, just through full equilibration. So in order to effectively verify ocean CDR, we have to take into account the dynamics of the ocean circulation. And in a priori, given that the spatial and temporal timescales involved and the, the small signal to noise ratios, we can say that models will have to play an important role in verification. Observations are also important, but models will play a role in the detection attribution frameworks uh, needed to make a robust MRV framework. And so that's what we are working on at Seaworthy. Our goal is to build um, scientifically supported software to quantify the efficacy of ocean carbon dioxide removal and basically provide a framework for market quality MRV. I'd like to acknowledge um, our funders. We have a diverse collection of philanthropic and grant supported funding. Um, and uh, we are off to the races. So let me tell you a little bit about um, what Seaworthy is. We are a focused research organization, so a nonprofit uh, organization. And our intention for being a nonprofit is to serve as a uh, fair arbiter of the best available science in this space. Um, a focused research organization is a new type of uh, entity. It aims to be something like a hybrid between a startup company an academic research lab and um, and a you know more uh, staid sort of government uh, infrastructure development um, uh, a federal federally funded research and development lab an FFRDC. Um, it's characterized by the attributes that I've listed here. Um, all our work will be public and in the public domain. Um, I'm really quite proud of this team we're developing. We have nine people on staff currently. Um, with exceptionally uh, high quality backgrounds and capacity. So we are really, really excited to um, put these people to work and start building um, the tools that we envision. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, how we're conceiving of our program and it entails these three central pillars of activity. So the first is software infrastructure. And this is really focused on explicit fit for purpose models mechanistic models of the ocean system and the impacts of CDR in that system. And then we aim to tailor those models to support applications, uh, including MRV, and then things like uh, observing system simulation experiments to ensure a capacity to design robust observing platforms to, to, um, to contribute to MRV. 
Um, we are also conducting applied research and that entails ensuring that our models have the have process representations that are consistent with the best available science. Um, how to use models and observations in concert to perform MRV is actually an open question in and of itself. And so we are working to actually work through the methodology. How do we apply these models to, um, to develop robust paradigms for MRV? And then finally, as um, many of you on the call will undoubtedly know, integrating models is extremely computationally intensive requires high performance computing infrastructure. And so our capacity to track carbon in the ocean is contingent on, our, on uh, access to high performance computing. Um, and there just remains substantial bottlenecks in that space. So we're working to uh, figure out how to evade those bottlenecks. Finally, we aim to release standard products for MRV and we have one such product um, in development in prototype form now that I'll talk a little bit about in a few slides. But just a few words on this. So we're calling our system C-STAR. It compri it's comprised of a ocean general circulation model coupled with uh, biogeochemical um, and other process models and a data assimilation system. We're deploying this model in the context or prototypes of this model in the context of explicit field trials. We're partnering with the Carbon to Sea Initiative to uh, support a field trial site in a fjord in Iceland. And then we're conducting our own field trial with support from NOAA in the San Francisco Bay and experiment plan for next summer. We recognize given the large, given the, given the nature of this problem, a requirement for a multi-scale capacity. And so we're working on that. And as, uh, and I wanna communicate our one central ethos is that we view this not as a purely technical exercise, but a technical exercise that is situated in the context of community development because explicitly we recognize that good low friction tools have the capacity to form a center of gravity for collaborative development and through their application to the problems of interest, um, provide a framework for codifying consensus. And so this is a really significant motivation for our work to be extraordinarily proactive and open source um, and inclusive providing opportunities for our tools to be used and applied by a diversity of actors in the space. Just a few words on this applied research division. So the more complexity or higher resolution or the number of ensembles you wanna run with a model, um, uh, increase the compute cost and the data requirements. But we're now operating in this highly disruptive uh, space where um, high performance computing architectures are becoming heterogeneous. Moore's law is essentially um, being violated or Denard scaling as, as uh, more explicitly. Um, and systems are moving to be more GPU centric rather than CPU centric. This presents real challenges for the existing geophysical codes that are largely written in Fortran and the requirements of making the leap to GPUs are uh, require substantial effort. Not unrelated is the revolution in AI. And so our capacity to track, um, to, to achieve our objectives um, requires a capacity to track and leverage these revolutions as they as they occur. Notably, we are not doing open-ended research, but we're interested in solving the MRV problem so that Ocean CDR can make uh, as as good a contribution to the contribute to mitigating climate change as possible. And so we've defined these pragmatic targets for our MRV systems. This uh, list is really the brainchild of my co-founder, Alicia Karspeck. And I just wanna highlight um, some of the things on this list very briefly. Notably, uh, an MRV system has to be cheap enough such that the carbon transactions, uh, you know, that, that, that the cost of carbon removal or the price of carbon removal can support the cost of MRV. How might we do that in the context of the complexity of the system and the computational intensity of these problems? Well, one hypothesis that we're exploring in this space relies on impulse response functions. And the idea here is that you force a model with a finite impulse of alkalinity uh, for an ocean alkalinity enhancement uh, system. You simulate a, you do a forward integration and simulate the impact of that pulse on air sea uh, exchange, developing something that we might call a characteristic uptake curve. And that characteristic uptake curve can be called a Green's function. It is essentially the, the um, 
it provide the integration kernel that you can use to uh, reconstruct the temporal evolution of uptake in a continuous release experiment. So we're working on establishing this methodology. It's contingent upon linearity, as many of you might recognize, and the limits of that linearity. The carbonate system is non-linear, but the limits of that linearity are something that we're currently exploring. We've actually done uh, a fully global set of impulse response function experiments on this uh, region mask shown here. And that's enabled us to map out um, the projected efficiency of ocean alkalinity enhancement as it's deployed globally. So what you see here by row is the evolution of the, the change in the carbon inventory divided by the amount of alkalinity that we put in. So this is the metric of the efficiency of OAE. And each column denotes the, the season in which we released alkalinity into the ocean. And so what you see here really is the imprint of ocean circulation on the efficiency and a secondary imprint of the gas exchange timescale. Um, there's a lot of structure in the field in the first year and the evolution of the field over time has a lot of interesting structure as well. There's a ton of that stuff to think about in the context of how markets, carbon markets will assimilate this type of information. Um, but uh, let me just check, let me just move forward to this last part. So that data set is something that we are working to publish as a V0 of um, something that might underpin a statistical framework for MRV. Um, it's generated at this point with a coarse resolution model, but presuming that we can pin down all the uncertainties um, associated with how this works and its validity, um, we anticipate that providing this data set will provide a, a key um, uh, you know, component of an MRV system. So we're partnering with Carbon Plan to build an interactive uh, web interface uh, allowing exploration and download of these type of data. Okay, I'll just return quickly to my key points and end there with the statement that um, we're currently hiring. And so if you know people who have competency in oceanography, biogeochemistry, please send them to our website and there's links there uh, to apply for the jobs that are open. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Matthew Law. That's an excellent presentation. Now we can open up for questions. Uh, you can submit through Q&A or raise your hand. Um, Okay, I see Dr. Um, Jessica Cross said that look at how high that efficiency is in Alaskan coastal waters. Yeah, that's a nice spot. <laughs> I imagine ice gets in the way of the efficiency a little bit as we move further into the Arctic, Matt, but those subarctic regions I think are gonna end up being pretty popular. That's right. I mean, I, except in winter where there's deep vertical mixing, certainly, I mean, the North Atlantic and the North Pacific have very different dynamics. Um, mm. The North Atlantic in winter is not a great place to release alkalinity. It just goes straight to the bottom. Are you starting to think about this, um, uh, these concepts of leakage at all, Matt? Um, uh, that maybe even though you might be missing the tail end of that efficiency of your uh, efficiency plateau, wouldn't it be better to get like two or three years of really high alkalinity enhancement and then bury those water masses in deep convection so that they don't release that CO2 back into the atmosphere? Are you starting to think about the... Hmm. So leakage, I find to be a ambiguous term and it's so it really is important to define but um, what we have right now is a conceptual model that explains the patterns in the data set that in the data sets and that model consists of a three box model where we have an exchange time scale with the atmospheric reservoir and an and a, and a leakage term where we're in this context we're talking about leakage as the removal of alkalinity from the surface ocean and then and at times so into a deep box and then a and then an exchange time scale of that deep box with uh, the atmosphere. And so with these three rate constants, we can basically represent all the, you know, all the patterns evident in that fully explicit, you know, general circulation model. Um, it's interesting because you can get the same efficiency with different combinations of these parameters. And um, 
to address one of your points, I think you know ocean alkalinity enhancement increases the buffer capacity of seawater, and so I don't think we actually there is actually a requirement to remove that water from the surface. Once the carbon is absorbed, it's stored in the form of largely bicarbonate, and it's it's secure. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, I hear Merda said that if you are unable to raise your hand, just come off mute and ask. Now I'm going to uh, go to Jack uh, Rivell of BOM, Alaska region. How does water temperature affect efficiency? What is the mechanism if this has been identified? I don't know if this question is going to address to Matt or uh, Jessica, but you both can <laughs> take a shot at this. I can take a stab at it. Um, so uh, for ocean alkalinity enhancement, one of the key things to understand is the gas exchange time scale, which is contingent upon the partial differential, uh, the, 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 the partial differential of aqueous CO2 with respect to DIC. And that varies latitudinally. And in particular um, in the, tropics um, it's slow and in the high latitudes it's fast and it also affects the equilibrium concentration of DIC relative to the change in alkalinity and so there's sort of two components to the efficiency one is related to the time scale and explicitly the gas exchange time scale relative to the surface water residence time scale so if the gas exchange if equilibration is fast then you can get away with the short surface water residence time um, but then the, the fully equilibrated efficiency is contingent upon the latitudinal distribution really in the ratio of alkalinity to DIC. And so it's really that ratio that's, that's critically important. I see okay. Wilbert has a hand. Uh, yes, let's uh, go to Wilbur next. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, well, since um, IRPIC is a, is a kind of a, a federal um, a conglomerate basically, I, I would like to, um, ask your opinion, and first I'll ask it to Matt, and then probably to Jessica, uh, because she was about to say, say something about that. What the role of the, the federal government, and, and maybe state and, and local governments, uh, would be in um, marine-based carbon sequestration? Jessica is probably better qualified to answer that question than I am. But you're muted. Losing the control. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, to talk about that a little bit, I'll go ahead and share my screen again. Uh, I know it's not in presenter no mode, but I figure you guys can handle it. Um, uh, so um, one of the things that the federal government is thinking about right now, at least in the U.S., uh, is how do we start pilot programs? Uh, and so that's certainly been evident in the Ocean Climate Action Plan, um, which uh, was released by the White House Office of OSTP, and a few of the authors of which are on the call today, I believe. Um, field trials were also called for in the National Academy's reports on ocean CDR, as well as the one on negative emissions. Um, that was released a, a couple of years before that. So we had the National Academies report that call for field trials. Field trials ended up in the Ocean Climate Action Plan. They've also been evident in a couple of agency research plans. So that's including the Department of Energy's uh, Earthshots, Carbon Negative Earthshot Program, as well as NOAA's recent research strategy or proposed research strategy for carbon dioxide removal research. Um, no. Uh... So one of the things that we're working on at PNNL is thinking about how to get those field trials off the ground. Um, there are a, a variety of different ways that we're doing that. As Matt stated, it's really important to develop these uh, standards and protocols and networks in a consensus-based context. The National Academies report really heavily emphasized that too. Uh, and so we are starting to think about, you know, exactly what, you know, an MRV framework might look like and how it adheres to, you you know, existing, existing agency rules and maps to things like uh, 45Q, uh, for example. Um, uh, and we're working with a diverse team of folks to do that, um, perhaps including Seaworthy, Matt. Were you on that proposal? Yeah, I think so. I wasn't, uh, but we talked to Shinmaya yesterday about joining. Yeah. Um, 
We're also starting to think about what test sites look like. Uh, so we have a funded project uh, to do some laboratory-based testing uh, at a facility in the Pacific Northwest uh, in conjunction with Ebb Carbon, a private company that's studying alkalinity enhancement, as well as two national labs, Pacific Northwest National Labs and PMEL, um, a Pacific Marine Environmental Lab, a NOAA lab. And that's been funded through the National Ocean Partnership Program. Um, NOP just recently had a $22 million call um, that funded a bunch of research. Uh, but right now, I want to emphasize it's one-off research um, uh, call. And what we're trying to do is build broader network of support than that. Um, essentially, what we want to do is we want multiple different entities uh, to have opportunities to build these test sites uh, in a regional context. And what we hope that does uh, is, you know, uh, help create the research consortia that are necessary um, to uh, assess these field trials from a variety of different angles. Yes, the efficiency of carbon removed is important. Yes, the MRV is important. But so is keeping track of the environmental impacts uh, and so is making sure that those uh, trials uh, in the ecosystem health of those test sites um, are reported as transparent as transparently as is humanly possible um, uh, 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 and sort of training uh, as many of the private companies as we can uh, into thinking about MRV uh, as a transparent process. Um, so uh, uh, those were my supporting slides uh, kind of on that, but um, I hope that with the rack of bills, uh, federal research bills that was passed last year, including the IRA, um, including uh, the Chips and Science Act, that we'll continue to see further investment from the US federal government in scaling these test sites. Um, think about if we had uh, a program uh, for test sites uh, for marine carbon dioxide removal or ocean-based carbon dioxide removal, the same way that we had the DAC hubs, which you may have heard about on the national news. Um, so uh, uh, I'd there's certainly some conversations around that happening right now, uh, but, uh, you know, keep your ear to the ground. I read the news the same as you can. Thanks, Jessica. I think I think uh, Matt Long uh, respond to some of those questions on the modeling aspect. Uh, so can you just uh, uh, explain that to the audience maybe? Uh, or, yeah, I, think, I, I don't know if... Uh, uh, you, uh, you, Lu, uh, is your question being answered by um, Madison Chad? Or yes, answered. yes. Thank you very much, Matt. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, yeah I see um, Matt in his cape. I, I think, yeah, he has a hand up, but we didn't get to him, but he had to leave. Uh, he said that um, I unfortunately have to add out, but we'll leave a question and we'll check the recordings. If you have time to address it, for Jessica, is the state of Alaska undertaking a review of permitting and financing financing pathways in conjunction with other efforts to enable development of mariculture and potentially CDR industry? Sure. Um, great question. Uh, in a certain way, the bill that I talked about um, uh, kind of addresses that, but I know that there has been some interest from the Oh, I'm going to get the acronym wrong. The Governor's Climate Star Task Force or something like that. Cl climate, I don't know. Um, uh, there's been a there's a working group um, uh, on climate change uh, in the governor's office that has talked about doing that before. I'm not aware that that effort is materializing, but I also want to emphasize I may not have the most inside track there. Uh, and if there's another person on the line who may know more about that process, I really encourage you to drop an answer in the chat. Yes, maybe is my answer. Okay, I see. Uh, thanks, Jessica. I see uh, Jaluka's uh, hand is up for a while. <laughs> now it's your turn. Yeah, hi. Um, a question probably for uh, Matt, first of all. I, I mean, it's really interesting and... Uh, uh, what, what you're doing with the models. But the question is, I mean, it, it reflects a little bit the question I've been asked already. Most of the physics, and, uh, and not it's not to talk about the chemistry and the biogeochemistry, probably you, you need to model what you, you need to do is highly parameterized in, uh, in, in any ocean model, probably. And, and on top of that, uh, we are trying to put, if I understand it right, some uh, linear um, response uh, model uh, to to come up with these efficiencies, if I understood it right, 
Um, so mostly my question is, would you be, do you think you would be able to get the same, it's a physical oceanography question, of course, would you be able to come up with the same answer essentially by using some very simple physical considerations without going into models and simulations and this kind of things? And do you think that will help you in giving a sense of the robustness of, of your results or at least uncertainty of your results? I mean, mostly, from a physical oceanography perspective, I think most of what you're looking at is the result of parameterization, which might be right. I'm not saying it's wrong, but did you put any thought about the uncertainty that comes out of there? Um, so first of all, uh, some of the data I showed, you know, are from a coarse resolution global general right. circulation model, order one degree. Um, I don't have any fantasy that those patterns are you know, 100% accurate by any means. Um, I would say, you know, different regions are responding to both the resolved flow and parameterized flow differently. You know, the vertical mixing dynamics in the North Atlantic are buoyancy driven. Uh, fluxes of alkalinity out of the surface ocean mediated by the, by the you know, boundary layer scheme. Um, but the transport of alkalinity in the Gulf Stream is part of the re resolved flow and the resolved flow has significant biases. Um, so we're well aware of the deficiencies of models. Um, we uh, have the objective really of um, accelerating the pipeline needed to instantiate regional domains at very high resolution um, in order to, uh, in, in, in a very strategic way, which is to say that as Jessica alluded to, there is a bottleneck right now in the field that uh, relates to our ability to test the efficacy of these deployments in the context of field trials. And so the regional scale is a really critical strategic place to focus because you can resolve the flows at scales commensurate with the observing capacities that are uh, deployed in those field trials. And so what we envision is, uh, you know, an ability to support field trials quite robustly with models that are fit for purpose in the sense that they can be deployed rapidly. They do the calculation that you want to have done they support the types of applications that are needed in the context of those field trials. And then we imagine putting ourselves on something like a spiral staircase where as we're deploying and continually testing and validating these systems in different settings, um, we will grow, build confidence in, in, in the framework, um, in the frameworks and uh, be able to more robustly transfer what we learn in particular settings to other settings. And then, you know, there's all sorts of, um, you know, the, the, the integrations that I showed you with the global model comprised 315 uh, year integrations with a model that's relatively cheap, but still that was order 16 million compute hours. Um, and so the requirements for, you know, a deep um, computational resources are large if we're going to confront some of these challenges brute, in a brute force way. And so, we're exploring different approaches to basically leverage uh, AI driven approach, you know, AI to, to um, kind of pull some of the computational intensity out of this problem, but doing so in a very judicious way, acknowledging that observations are actually quite sparse. So there's another problem, which is just associated with building up our capacity to track to high degree of fidelity, what's happening in nature through um, investments in our observing systems, both the backbone systems and the bespoke assets that we might deploy in the context of CDR perturbations. Um, but you know, I think all all that stuff in this in this space is going to is is really sort of an evolution. And so one of our goals at Seaworthy is to really just embrace all these challenges head on and provide something of a fountainhead to coordinate you know community efforts and to. Um, and to push forward in, in, in making these things a reality, acknowledging that, you know, a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the pieces of this puzzle exist. They exist in academia, they exist in federal labs, but um, we really need a focused effort to pull them all together and, and address this problem. Um, and so that's, that's what we're doing. And, 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 and really what we're doing is trying to set the trajectory of the system, not solve all the problems all at once, but dig in, identify some paths to solutions and start putting the bricks in, you know, building, building the bricks as needed to, um, to ensure that the industry is going to evolve on the basis of sound science.
Yeah, one of the um, concepts that we talk about a lot is that uh, a terrestrial CDR struggles right now with a proliferation of um, of voluntary standards that are really hard to track. What's a good standard? What's a bad standard? What qualifies under which standards? Um, and right now, the ocean space doesn't have that. Um, in a way that that can be a liability, it's harder to sell credits that are based on ocean CDR because uh, there are just fewer opportunities to do that. Um, but it's also an opportunity because you can trust the credits that are coming online because there's only a handful of ways to evaluate them. And the kind of work that Matt is doing is trying to keep us kind of in that happy medium space that sort of what does get certified, you can count on that certification. Um, uh, and I, I know that the community will benefit from that approach in the long term because we won't have to question, we won't have to ask the same questions of the ocean CDR space, I hope, uh, as we have to ask of the uh, terrestrial space uh, at the current juncture, less noise in the market, as it were. Yeah. I mean... Thanks. Sorry, I think, uh, Matt, you, uh, you go ahead. Go ahead, go, go ahead. I, I'm, I'm going to have to. I'm gonna to have to leave. I apologize. I have other another commitment. Yeah, yeah. Thank you all for all great speakers because they have other commitment. They took time off on their busy schedules to give up excellent talk. We casually follow up with them for for a long time because they both changed their positions during our, you know, <laughs> trying to have them as a, giving this speech, a uh, speak uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.